Well, good morning. Happy New Year. It is 2021. Has to be better than 2020, but the bar is pretty low for that. Okay. Um, this COVID thing just keeps going on and on. It just kind of seems to be getting worse and worse. Um, but I had a fantastic time in St. Lucia and uh, every day was 85 degrees and sunny, 72 at night. Then I had to come back <laughs> to the real world, <laughs> but it's all good. So just a reminder that we have the test corrections for the exam due tomorrow by midnight. Go ahead and do cam scanner on that. Uh, you have all of the answers online, so there's really no excuse there. You just need to go through and do it and make your corrections and see what you missed. Okay. Once again, I had two great videos uh, going over that. I tried two times, I should say, to do the same thing, uh, but the iPad would not communicate with my computer for some reason or other. So um, those of you that got it live, you're blessed. And those of you that missed out, COVID sucks. And so <laughs> um, we're going to start in today on thermochemistry. Okay, so we're kind of right on schedule. We just kind of need to push these next units. The rest of the year are all your big AP categories. We, we've gotten all the foundational material in now. We got um, you know, all the bonding and shapes and hybridization and um, solution chemistry and molarity and all of those things. That's all the foundation. And now we need to really start talking about what really is true chemistry. And so, um, if I just want to start off. doing something that I always do. So I have this piece of paper. Okay. So is this piece of paper hot in any way, shape, or form? But if I go and I just put just a little bit of flame, now all of a sudden there's a tremendous amount of heat coming off of this. The question is, where does all of that energy come from? How can, first off, <laughs> to review, what is fire? Why do we, what are we seeing in there? What is, what is fire? Something with oxygen. Well, that's the, it's the result of the combustion reaction of the paper plus oxygen. That's the chemical reaction taking place. So how is all light produced? We talked about this a little bit. So it's the electron moving thing from the higher to the low. That's right, the electron transition goes up and then comes back down and gives off light, right? Well, how do we get the electron up? How? What type of energy? There's only two types. Light. No. Two ways to excite an electron. Heat it, up. Heat it up, or how do we make all this light? Electricity. electricity. You either put heat on it, on the atoms, or you give them electricity, and that causes the electrons to get promoted. They naturally want to come back down to a lower energy. Okay? So, when we do this chemical reaction of paper plus oxygen, it is an exothermic reaction. Heat's being released. Well, where is it being released to? Where does the heat get released to in that reaction? The environment. To the environment, to the surroundings. Remember, we always have two. We have the system and we have the surroundings. The system is the actual chemicals that are reacting. The paper plus the oxygen is the system. The surrounding is everything else. So the system is releasing energy to the surroundings. Well, that heat then does what to the electrons of the surrounding air and the you know, CO2 that's being given off and any of the other products that are given off all the surroundings, what happens to those electrons? They get excited. They go to the higher energy level. And then when they come back down, what do we see? 
fire. So there's heat being released from the exothermic chemical reaction and then there's light being released as the result of the electrons been going up and coming back down. So fire is the result of an exothermic chemical reaction that causes the electrons in the surrounding air and any gases that are being produced in the reaction, those electrons get excited. When they come back down, they give off light. So most of the time, again, when you see things getting heated up, what's the first color we see? How do you tell when a piece of metal is getting hot? White. Not before white. Right. Red. That thing is red hot. Red's the first color, because what do we know in terms of energy? Roy G. Biv, red's the low energy end. It's the first color we're going to see. Now, as things get hotter and hotter and things get more and more energetic, then you start going to seeing some of the yellows. And then when it's super, super hot, we see the white because all the colors blend together. Okay. So thermal chemistry is all about these energy changes. How do we measure those energy changes? Okay. So I'm just going to give you these notes. I'm going to take this sweatshirt off because I'm going to be working hard today. Should have done this ahead of time. And get one more thing going. All right, we're just gonna let that kind of cook for a little bit. Let's just define thermal chemistry. What do you think that is? What's thermo? Well, I, I, I'm the guy that's in here. I heard somebody say something right here. What it was? Heat. Thermo is our energy. Okay, it's the study of energy and its transformation. All right, so let's just talk about what we're going to look at. This is, this is what this whole unit's going to be, all right? And if you want, we can make this a Roman numeral one. I'll try and follow some kind of outline structure. It's the study of the relationship between heat, work, of fuels. Just a, maybe another definition. The study. Relationship to 
between energy changes and chemical reactions. This is really what we're going to focus on. Okay? The energy changes in chemical reactions. I burn a piece of paper, where does that heat come from? What, what's causing that to happen? Okay, so it's gonna be all about the energy as the result of a chemical reaction. So we say then C, objects can possess energy Two ways. What are our two ways? What do you think? Potential energy. Potential energy is one. What's the other one? Kinetic. Kinetic energy. We'll start with kinetic. What is kinetic energy? What's kinetic energy? What's that energy of? Motion. Energy of motion. So what's the formula for it? Somebody else to has to know an answer. <laughs> okay. Be bold, y'all. Come on. Speak up. Okay? I don't even. This, this is why it's blocking your vision so that you can participate. One half mv squared. What does m stand for? Yeah. Mass. And what unit must mass always be in? And all of these, remember, we're MKS system, meters, kilograms, seconds. Length is always in meters, mass is always in kilograms, time is always in seconds. And then you have moles as well. So it's always got to be kilograms. And then V stands for velocity, which we know as speed. And that unit is always meters per second. So what do we know about kinetic energy of substances at the same temperature? If two substances are at the same temperature, what do we know about their average kinetic energy? It's the same, right? That's something we've already talked about a good deal. Same kinetic energy, okay? So same temperature equals same average kinetic energy. So we can say then, for just continuing on here, this is where we say, heat them up. What? Speed them up. Just to review, the Maxwell, Boltzmann, temperature distribution graph. So we always have the number of molecules and then the average kinetic energy or the speed of the molecules. So if I have, this is at T1, if I go to T2 at a higher temperature, what's going to happen? Slope, the, the peak's going to be lower and move to the right. 
okay? And just for those of you watching this impressive video here, people are giving me hand signals in the back. You can't hear anything on this video because they refuse to talk loud enough to be audible. However, they are having some responses out there and there really are people, students uh, in the classroom as uh, <laughs> we're going through this, okay? So it's going to be lower and it's gonna be farther to the right. So it's gonna look like that. So the average kinetic energy, now again, if I were to draw these to scale, the area under the purple curve would be exactly the same area as under the blue curve because of the same number of molecules. And the area under the curve represents the total number of molecules. It's just the range is always spread out as you heat it up. So as I'm heating this up, the average kinetic energy, the temperature is going up. Molecules are beginning to move faster and faster. They are absorbing the energy from this chemical reaction of natural gas plus oxygen is giving off heat. It's giving off a lot of heat because we see the blue flame, the fire. That heat is then going, and this is part of the surroundings. The surroundings absorbing the heat, but it's absorbing it in the form of kinetic energy and the molecules are moving faster and faster and faster and faster, okay? So this is T2, and T2 is greater than T1. Now we could also then look, okay, so this is the same gas, same gas at different temperatures. Same gas at different But what if we did the same graph, number of molecules versus the speed again, but this is going to be two different gases at the same temperature. This is gas one, gas two. Which can we, which one is the smaller, lighter molecule? Which, again, I, I heard mumble. Gas two. Gas two, why gas two? Because it's moving faster. It's moving faster. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. If these two kinetic energies are the same, if one velocity is faster than the other, then the mass has to be less. As this number goes up, this number has to go down to equal the same number. So the greater the mass, the slower the velocity. The slower the velocity. And I always say, if you have a big mass, you ain't going fast. Okay? So here, gas two is greater than gas one in terms of speed. All right? So that's, this is all review. But with, this is very important in terms of how molecules absorb energy, that sometimes they absorb them in terms of kinetic energy. But now, this is boiling. And when I put a thermometer in here, When I put a thermometer in here, the temperature is going to go up to what, te what temperature? 212 Fahrenheit, but what Celsius? 100 degrees Celsius, right? And so once it gets up to 100 degrees, does water ever get to 110, 120? <laughs> Not at normal atmospheric pressure, it doesn't. Maybe in a pressure cooker, if you have artificial pressure, Remember, boiling occurs, vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. But now, what's happening? What's in the bubble? Water vapor. Water vapor. So in other words, the water molecules are breaking apart from one another. In the liquid, in the liquid, they're all next to one another. They're all stuck, okay? 
But now you put them into, you're heating them up, and you're breaking this one off from this one, and this one's from that, no water. This one's breaking off from this one, okay? And they're separating from each other. You're putting energy in, you're breaking the bonds. So now you're not changing their energy, you're not, pardon me, you're not changing their velocity, you're changing their position relative to one another. You're breaking bonds. What type of energy is that? What type of energy is energy of position? We only have one other type. Potential energy, you're right. Ooh, right here, let's start over. So right now, all of the energy is going into breaking the bonds. The water is staying at a constant 100 degrees Celsius. So this is going to be two potential energy. Okay, so this is one kinetic energy, two potential energy, right on your outline? Because it's not, no, I had numbers here. Molecules rearrange. And that's what we call a chemical reaction. There are changes in potential energy. Any chemical reaction is going to involve changes in potential energy. The system, that things that are actually reacting are changing. When you change the positions, as you break bonds, move molecules or atoms apart, and then they rearrange and, and combine a new and form a new molecule, you're changing their position relative to each other. You're changing their potential energy. This is latent heat. which means hidden to the thermometer. Latent means hidden. Uh, you may have heard of somebody having latent potential. It means that, man, there's potential. If he just hasn't seen it yet, it's, just, it's still just hidden, but it's there. A coach can see that in a player before the player sometimes can see it in themselves. It's latent, it's hidden. Hidden to the thermometer. which means temperature doesn't measure that, okay? So whenever there's chemical reactions, right now we're breaking bonds, the potential energy is changing, but the thermometer's not. It's latent heat, it's breaking bonds, it's a potential energy. When I take this rubber band, I put work into it, I stretch it, I'm giving it potential energy. It did not go up in temperature at all. But it has potential now to come back to where it was before. But changing and rearranging atoms and molecules is always a change in potential energy. So sometimes things can gain energy. Right now this is again, it's staying right at 100 degrees. It's gaining a ton of energy, but it's staying at the same temperature. Phase changes, which is what we're looking at here. Phase changes, solid to liquid, liquid to gas, involve changes in potential energy.
does J stand for? Joules. Joules, it's the measure of heat. Okay, so we have the temperature. So if we want to look at, say, an ice cube, we can start at negative 15, 0, 100. Okay? So if I'm looking at this, I don't like that purple pen. If I take the ice cube, take it out of the freezer, put it in my, into my glass, and then I pour the water into my glass, that ice cube is not going to begin melting immediately. What has to happen to the ice cube first? It has to heat up. So it's going to start here, and then it's going to heat up until it gets to zero degrees. Because the water you put in was way warmer than zero. So then, the ice is going to begin to melt. The temperature remains constant. That's supposed to be a horizontal line. I don't know. If it's fairly horizontal. Okay? But once all the ice is melted, then we can begin changing temperature again until it gets to 100. Then it's going to begin to boil. That line's a lot longer. Then once it's all turned into steam, then the steam can go on to infinite temperatures. Now eventually the water molecule will decompose into hydrogen and oxygen, and so there is an upper limit, but you can get the steam to very high temperatures before that happens. So when we're looking here, change in temperature, that's a change in kinetic energy. Whereas the phase change, this is a change in potential energy. So this again, temperature change, change in kinetic energy. This is a change in potential energy. So it's, whenever it's constant, and this is a change in kinetic energy. Temperature changes, kinetic energy is changing. Phase changes, you're breaking bonds and forming bonds, is a change in potential energy. Okay, you good with all that? So, to measure this, we use one half mv squared. To measure this, the change in heat is equal to your mass times your heat of fusion. I'm going to come and I'm going to define your heat of fusion. Here again, we use one half mv squared. Oh, oh what am I decide? Backtrack. I'm sorry. I gave the wrong equation. Sorry. We could use one half mv squared, but that's not how we're going to measure it. The change in kinetic energy is going to be measured with mc delta t. And we're going to call that quantity Q. Q is going to represent our heat. And I'm going to define all of this as soon as I write all this up. And so the next thing, I'm going to define all these units for you. Okay? So again, it's going to be MC delta T. And that's going to equal Q. This is going to be the delta H is going to equal mass times your delta heat of vaporization. MC delta T again equals Q. This would be Q of the ice. This would be Q of the water. This would be Q of the steam. And these can also, we can represent this with Q as well. Instead of H, H or Q is going to either one. So let's talk about what all that means. This is another very important graph. 
that you're going to need to know backwards and forwards and know how to calculate. Specific heat. Little letter C. Now, the problem is, is you got to know what C represents in each different equation because C also is the speed of light and E equals MC squared and all that. But in thermochemistry, C is going to be your specific heat. Does anybody know what, remember what the definition of specific heat is? Anyone? How much energy does it take to raise this water? It's the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of H2O, no, pardon, not H2O, one gram of, the su of any substance, one gram of the substance, one degree Celsius. The amount of heat needed to raise one gram of the substance, one degree. Now for water, that value is one. One calorie raises one gram, one degree. So to raise one gram of water from zero to 100 takes 100 calories, okay? Where have you heard the term calorie? <clears throat> Food. Now, this is a little bit depressing, okay? And especially since we're in the new year and, you know, uh, of course I'm said I'm gonna lose weight, okay? I lost a lot of weight. You know, I lost about 20 to 30 pounds last year, but I gained about 50. And so, <laughs> so it's just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm definitely on the upward trend here. But, um, a food calorie is actually a kilocalorie. A calorie is defined as the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water one degree. That's a calorie. So a food calorie is a kilocalorie, a thousand of those calories. So when it's Snickers bar that we got in our stockings for Christmas, it says you know, 280 calories on it. It's actually 200. And 80,000 of these calories, because it's supposed to be a capital C, which is a nutritional calorie, which is a kilocalorie. All right? Now, the only good news on that is when we go out and we jog and we exercise and we burn calories, we're burning kilocalories as well. Okay? And then trivia How many calories or kilocalories does it take to lose a pound? Pound of fat is the equivalent of how many calorie food nutritional calories? hundred thousand. No, not quite that many. It seems like that. Fifty thousand. Now you're way high. Uh, three thousand. Okay, you're way closer. Two thousand. You're not as close. Twenty-five hundred. <laughs> Keep going. Five thousand. A little bit less. A little bit less. 3,500. 3,500. Ding, ding. We have a winner. <laughs> Only 20 guesses. 3,500 calories. So if you want to lose a pound, you have to burn 3,500 more calories than you take in. So that's why they say a Snickers bar is, you know, a moment on the lips, forever on the hips. Okay? It's because it's so hard to burn off those calories that, and you know, you go out and you run, you maybe you go and do a, a lap on the track out there at Veterans Park <laughs> and you say, all right, you know, and you go and look at your Fitbit or whatever and you see, oh man, I burned 250 calories, <laughs> you know, or 500, but it's still just one Snickers bar is all you burned off, you know, not the four, four or five pieces of pizza and the Coke and whatever else that you just ate. So it takes, takes a lot to burn off those calories. Okay, so the specific heat. This is, to me, this is what measures how much 
energy does a degree cost? Okay, so if I look at water, which has a specific heat of one calorie per gram degrees Celsius, which in joules is 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Okay, that's the specific heat of water. The specific heat of gold is equal to 0.22 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Double check that. Make sure I'm giving you accurate information. Gold, specific heat. Blue at the bottom. Oh, it's less. It's 0.129. Is that aluminum? Oh, there's one of them that's 0.22. Gold is 0.129. Okay, so it, it doesn't matter for the example, but. So if I'm adding heat to each of these substances, I got 100 grams of water, 100 grams of gold, and I start adding heat to them equally, which one is going to go up in temperature more? Okay. Why are you saying water? What's your thought process? Because for every one degree, it's going up four point one eight one joules. You're going backwards. The joules is what it takes to raise one degree. One degree. It takes four joules to go up one degree. This one takes point one two nine joules to go up one degree. If you go into a store, you each have $100. Somebody's looking at the polo rack. Somebody else is looking at the sale rack. Who's going to be able to buy more clothes? Sale rack. The sale rack, right? Because it's cheaper. You have $100 each, but you can, if the cheaper it is, the more you can buy, the more quantity you can get. Well, the degrees are your clothes. The jewels is your money. How much energy is it going to take to cause a one degree change? So the lower the specific heat, the greater the temperature change. And I don't know how to say that. When two substances are heated equally, I'll just say that. When two substances of equal mass are heated equally, the substance with the lower specific heat will increase temperature more or less. The one with the lower specific heat will increase in temperature more than the other. Okay? That's a multiple choice type question on AP. They give you two with specific heat, which one's going to have the bigger temperature change? Okay? Does everybody kind of follow me now what specific heat is? It's the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of a substance, one degree, okay? And so, and then when you're comparing it, the, it's the cost of a change of degree Celsius, okay? So a degree here costs way more than a degree here. So you go in with equal amounts, this one's gonna go up more in temperature. All right, so that's your specific heat. So when I say this, then, that for changes in temperature, the amount of heat required which 
we represent as Q is equal to the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. Now, in this case, the mass is in grams because the specific heat is calculated in grams. Because I, I just said in this other one that mass has to be kilograms. But in this equation, because specific heat is given in grams, mass is in grams. Now, the specific heat, if you're, if you're going to do a problem, the specific heat is almost always given. Sometimes you have to calculate the specific heat, but then the other three quantities are given. But you can always just use these units to know what units everything else has to be in. Okay? So, for changes in temperature, the heat, you can calculate the heat with the mass times the specific heat because it's joules per gram degree Celsius. So you multiply this times the mass, gets rid of grams, times the change in temperature, gets rid of the degree Celsius, it tells you how many joules it takes. For phase changes, the amount of heat required, again Q, is equal to the mass times the delta H of fusion or mass times delta H of vaporization. Depends upon whether you're melting or boiling. So we have to define those. The heat of fusion. Energy needed to cause This is your delta H sub F, which is heat of fusion. Energy needed to cause one gram of a solid. Let me just finish this definition under your break. At its melting point to be to one gram of liquid at constant temperature. Okay, so the heat of fusion is how much it takes to change from at zero degrees, ice at zero degrees, to become water at zero degrees. Temperature doesn't change. Only the amount of potential energy changes. It's latent heat, okay? So this is latent heat, which means again, hidden to the thermometer, okay? And for water, delta H of fusion of water is equal to potential energy. So that means that once I get the ice to zero, I have to add in 334 joules just to be make it become water at zero. 
same temperature, just way more energy, the potential. You broke the bond. So what's that mean when the ice, when the water freezes? You gotta release the 334. So you, when you put the water into the freezer to make the ice cubes, you have to remove, get it down to zero, but then remove an additional 334 joules in order for it to be able to freeze and become an ice cube. Then once it's solid, then it goes down to temperature again. All right, let's take a break. Those of you watching online, you can fast forward for the next five minutes. I'm not gonna stop it, so I only have one file. All right, 
So, we have the heat of fusion is the energy needed. I really need that graphic, I know it's just erased, but if I look at what is it, B, the heat of vaporization. Delta H V, what's that definition going to be? At its boiling point, to be converted to one gram of a gas at constant temperature. Okay? So you can just copy that down. I'm going to save myself some time. And uh, All right, quick correction. The units on this, on the heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, does not have degrees Celsius in it, okay? Because it's constant temperature, so the temperature does not change, okay? So it's just joules per gram. That's why when we go and measure Q, the heat, all we have to do is joules per gram times grams equals joules. Joules per gram times grams equals joules. So Q is equal to the mass times your heat of fusion, heat of vaporization. So what that means is on this graph, is we add heat, the amount of heat we need to change from negative 15 to zero is by mc delta t, the mass times specific heat times change in temperature. But then once we get it to the, the freezing point up here to zero, we have to add in 334 joules per gram. That just changes it, that breaks the bonds, that breaks the water molecules apart. You're breaking bonds, you're changing its potential energy. So water at the same temperature as ice, water has this much more potential energy. The internal energy, the total kinetic and potential is greater here. Now notice that this slope is a little bit less than this slope, because the specific heat of water is higher than the specific heat of ice or steam. It's about double. And so as a result, uh, we end up having, a, it takes 
uh, more energy, a slower increase in temperature than the ice or the steam. But for steam, once you get the water to boiling, right now I'm having to add in 2255 joules for every gram of water just to make it go from liquid water to steam at 100 degrees. So the temperature has not gone above 100 degrees the entire time because all of the energy is being changed, used as potential energy, latent heat, to change it into a gas. Okay? Now, it's positive when we're adding heat in, it's negative when the heat's coming out. We're subtracting, we have to remove this much energy, or this much energy is released when steam condenses. So if I go and put my hand over this, and that steam at 100 condenses on my hand, it's gonna release the 2255 plus all the kinetic energy then into my hand to come back down to whatever my hand temperature is. So a steam burn is gonna be way worse than a boiling water burn because it has all that extra potential energy that has to be released. Have you ever wondered why a peach farmer, have you ever heard of peach farmers when the, you know, so there's a late frost in the spring and the peaches have begun to bloom or even be the form, and they'll go and spray the trees down with water. I said, that's the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life. Why would they do that? Just gonna make it freeze, just gonna kill it. But what happens is, is they spray the, the peach down with water. When it freezes, it has to release this energy. It releases this energy to the peach that's part of the surroundings. And so as that water freezes on the outside, it releases some energy into the peach, which is just enough to keep it from freezing. And then the ice on the outside, actually like, a, like an igloo, it actually insulates from any more cold. Now, that's only gonna work on a mild freeze. If it's a hard freeze, the peach is in trouble. But a mild freeze, they can do that because they're, they don't know it, but they're using that latent heat of vaporization, that latent heat of fusion, to cause the peach to absorb just a little bit of energy. All right. So, I think we need to just look at some math dealing with this, because you guys love math, okay? Is it making sense? Is all of this making sense to y'all? Okay. Some of it's review, some of it's not, just trying to get everything into perspective. The difference between kinetic and potential energy is very challenging to try to really wrap your brain around. How can you add heat to something in the temperature? And we always think if you add heat, the temperature is going to go up. Okay? But what is temperature a measure of? And what's the definition always? The average kinetic energy, that's right. It has nothing to do with potential energy. So anytime there's changes in potential, it's a hidden to the thermometer. Okay. Here's the example. So how much energy or heat is required to raise 15 grams of ice at negative 20 to water at 20 degrees Celsius? Okay, now you will be given the specific heat of ice and the delta H of fusion of water, we already said is 334 joules per gram. 
Now, I always have to look up the specific key to ice. I do not have that one memorized, but it's going to be given to you. Two point zero nine two. Okay, so all that's good. Never have to memorize specific heat values. Okay, you don't have to know these heat of fusion values. All those constants are always given. All right, the equations generally are given, and I'll double check with the on the equation sheet. But I'm at ninety nine percent confidence that the equation. For specific heat, the Q equals M cat is given. Okay, so where are we starting on this graph? Negative 20. Negative 20, so somewhere down over here, right? So, what's the first thing that we have to do? Heat up the ice to zero, right? So, I'm going to say QT for total is going to equal the Q of the ice from negative 20 to what? Zero. Zero. Okay, and everything's always Celsius. Okay, so we're not going all the way to 20 because we're just going to be warming the ice up. Then what do we have to do? Add in the heat of fusion. Right? We have to melt the ice. So we're going to say Q melt. Then what do we have to do? Heat up another 20 degrees. Heat it up another 20 degrees to get it to about here at 20 degrees Celsius. Right? So it's got to be Q of the water. So how do we calculate when there's when this is from zero up to 20 degrees? So how do I calculate? the Q when I have a temperature change. Q equals MCAT. Q equals MCAT. And, and that's the best way to remember it. You, most of y'all probably want to go to medical school or whatever. And so MC delta T I call MCAT because it's mass times specific heat times the change in temperature. And the MCAT is what you have to take in order to go to med school, the medical college admissions test. And so Q equals MCAT is just an easy way to remember that equation. So it's going to be the mass of the ice times specific heat of the ice times the change in temperature of the ice. Now, you would never have to do these individual steps. I'm just trying to do it step by step to kind of show you what we're doing. Mass of the ice times the delta H of fusion of ice plus the mass of the now water times specific heat of the water, which you'd be given as well. I already gave it to you, but 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. That's given times change in temperature of the water. So, if you're really a math math nerd, you could factor out the masses and just have it mass times parentheses all to everything else, but I think that that's extra work. But the mass is always going to be how much? 15 grams, because it's not going to change. Changing phases, we're not going to lose any. So we're going to have 15 grams times specific heat of ice, which is given 2.092 joules per gram degrees Celsius times, what's the change in temperature? 20. And by the way, delta T, delta T is always T final minus T initial. And that's going to get you your sign correct. All right. Delta T is always T final minus T initial. So this is going to be 
zero minus negative 20, so it comes out to be a positive 20 degrees. Plus 15 grams times 334 joules per gram plus 15 grams, 4.184 times the change in temperature of the water, which again will be a positive 20 degrees. When you're going up, the change in temperature is positive. If you're coming down, the change in temperature is negative. Then you just plug all that in your calculator. And I know that one of y'all has got a calculator out and wants to plug all that in. We only got four people, so somebody's got to do it. Not here. <laughs> Looks like I had the lucky chosen one. Notice the units, grams cancel here, degrees Celsius cancel here, grams cancel, so your joules, grams cancel, degrees Celsius cancel, so again, joules, joules, and joules, because if there weren't all joules, you couldn't add them together. So we're, now, so this all answer is joules, which would be how many kilojoules? Six point eight nine two eight kilojoules. That's the amount of energy you would have to add in to 15 grams of ice at negative 20 to get it just up to 20 degrees. So when you eat an ice cube, your body's expending this much energy. There's a whole <laughs> kind of thermochemistry joke about a, a beer and ice cream diet on uh, how you can lose weight uh, on a beer and ice cream diet because of, and they use the principle of heating up, how much energy it takes to heat up the cold to body temperature. Uh, but I should read it to you so you can figure out what the flaw in the logic is. But uh, we all pretty much know a beer and ice cream diet is not gonna cause you to lose weight, okay? It's gonna cause you to get fat and make some stupid decisions. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'll read that to you. Uh, I have a couple, two, couple of things uh, I'll read to you about thermochemistry. So, anytime there's a temperature change, you're going to use MCAT. Anytime it's a phase change, you're going to use M, the mass, just times the heat of fusion, heat of vaporization. There's a maximum of five Qs. We stopped here, Q of the water. We could have Q boil and then Q steam. Five Qs total possible, there's no more. We're not gonna go into plasma or any of that kind of stuff, okay? So you just gotta figure out where am I in the process, okay? Which way am I going? Because if I was going from 20 to negative 20, what's the only difference gonna be? The what? It's negative. It's negative, this much energy is released rather than this much energy is gained. Everything else would be the same. Now, what the way that's going to work out is that this is going to turn out to be negative. Your heat of fusion is negative, and this temperature change is going to be negative. So it's a minus, a minus, and a minus. We're going the other way. All right. You guys get to practice a couple. Where's the one that has my? It has all the questions circled. Oh, wow. Do 
you guys needed a mental break anyway. going to do one more practice with you. A common lab experiment is to determine the specific heat of a metal. And the way that you would do that is you would get a beaker of water that you're heating up, okay? And then you put the piece of metal, and we already used gold, so we'll stick with gold, And we're because this is Spain Park, we, we know we have a lot of gold just laying around. Okay? And you have that on a string. Okay? So, there's no air on the string. So that's on a string. This water is going to be at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? So you're going to have another beaker of water over here that's just at room temperature. So, we put this down into here for like three to five minutes. So what do we know about the temperature of the gold? It's gonna rise. To what? 100 degrees. It'll get to 100 degrees. You leave it in there long enough to where you feel like it's at 100 degrees. Okay? Now we've measured this amount of water in here. Let's just say that it's exactly 100 grams. Now, once you have the gold down in here, now we're going to take it and put it into here. So we know the gold's at 100 degrees. We know that the mass of the gold is how much gold do we have in here? We'll say 25 grams. That would be a lot. We'd be rich. Okay? 25 grams of gold. We're going to take that and we're going to put it into here. So what's going to happen when we put the hot gold into this water? The gold's going to cool off and the water's going to rise. What's causing the water to rise? Not the mass of the gold. The heat, the, the gold's cooling down, right? Where's that heat going? Into the water. Okay, law, first law of thermodynamics, the energy is neither created nor destroyed. Okay, so that means that the Q of the gold is equal to the negative Q of the water. Okay, or actually we can it, it probably make more sense to do it this way. The heat gained by the water is the same as the heat lost by the gold. Now, it really won't matter which side you put the negative on. It's going to work out math-wise either way. So, the heat lost by the gold. We want, we want to find what is the specific heat of the gold. Okay? So, I know that the mass of the gold times specific heat of the gold, times the change in temperature of the gold, is going to equal the negative. Whatever heat is lost by this is going to be gained by the water. Mass of the water 
time specific key to the water, change in temperature of the water. So the only other thing we need to know is what's the change in temperature of the water. Well, I wish I had this all figured out. I'm making it up and I know what the answer is supposed to be, but I'm just gonna make up some numbers and we'll just, you know, ignore the fact that they're not right. Okay, so let's just say, now first off, if it's 120, and we have 100 grams and 25 grams, do you expect the temperature to be an even? Do you think it's going to go somewhere, you know, it's like 60 degrees? Where do we expect the temperature? What would be real, realistic here? 25 to 30. 25 to 30, probably. So let's just say 25.2 degrees. That's your final temperature. This is your initial temperature, okay? So if the water gets to 25.2 degrees, what temperature is the gold getting to? You put the gold into the water, the water temperature rises up to 25.2. What, what temperature is the gold gonna be? 94.8. No. The gold started at 100. Nope. If you put two things into the same container, what happens to their temperature? Oh. It's going to be 25.2. It's going to be the same. They'll be in what's called thermal equilibrium, same temperature. Okay? Because this one's cooling down to the same temperature this one's heating up to. So it's going to end up, once, once, all the, once they're in thermal equilibrium, once they're at the same temperature, then the energy change is stopped. Okay? So, I know the mass of the gold, we said, was 25 grams. Specific heat of the gold is what I'm looking for. What's the change in temperature of the gold going to be? Okay, but we're going T final minus T initial. Since the temperature is going down, it's negative 74.8. The sign is very important here, so you get the sign right at the end. This is going to equal the negative mass of the water, 100 grams, times specific heat of the water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, times the change in temperature of the water. What's the change in temperature of the water? Positive 5.2 degrees. Okay? So now we just have to solve for this by dividing 25 grams and the negative 74.8 degrees Celsius. Degrees Celsius cancel, grams cancel, okay? Well, actually, this degree, so that, we'll leave this one here. That one canceled with that one. So you're going to grams canceled with this one, not this one. So we're going to be left with joules per gram degree Celsius. It doesn't really matter which ones you cancel out, it's still going to be joules per gram degree Celsius. So what do we get, somebody? 1.163. 1.163 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Now, that's much, much higher than what <laughs> we predicted. Okay? So, just for kicks and giggles, okay? Let's see if we did the exact same experiment, but we wanted to know what the final temperature, what would this final temperature really be? Okay, the exact same thing. Okay, so what is the final temperature? grams of gold is at, at 
100 degrees Celsius is placed into 100 grams of water at 20 degrees Celsius. The only thing that we're going to be given more specific heat of gold, which we could say is C of gold, is equal to 0.129 joules per gram degrees Celsius. That's given. So we have all this other information that's given. Okay, the only thing we're doing is now we know the specific heat. We're looking for our final temperature. So we don't know that one anymore. So we set it up the exact same way. Q lost equals the negative Q gain. So the lost is, is the Q of the gold is equal to negative Q of the water. So we have MC delta T, mass of the gold, 25 grams. Specific heat of the gold, now we know it's 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius. But this time we don't know the change in temperature. We're looking for the final temperature. So we can go to T final minus, but what was the initial temperature of the gold? 100 degrees. Okay? That's going to equal negative mass of the water, 100 grams, 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius, times, again, T final, minus, what's the initial temperature of the water? 20. 20. This is where we always have to know delta T, is T final minus T initial. Now, this is why you learn algebra. Not for the sake of algebra, but so you can do a real problem. What do we have to do here? How do we solve, how do we, how do we, you know, work from here and not do an algebra? Come on now, you guys are in pre-cal or calculus or something. We can do the simple algebra here. What do we have to do? Uh, stay loud with me here. Small, small. Okay, but before we do that, what do we have to do? Multiply this times this, and then use which property? Distribute. Distribute the property. That times this, that times that. Okay, so somebody give me what this value equals right here. And that's going to be joules per degree Celsius, okay, times TF minus 100 degrees Celsius. It's going to equal, now this one we can just move the decimal, so it's going to be negative 4184 joules per degree Celsius, but we've got to do the same thing, use the distributive property there. I just multiplied 100, that's 4. 18.4. Move to three places instead of two. Okay? That's an easy fix. So, now multiply. So we're going to get 3.225 times TF minus, again, we're going to multiply by 100, so 322.5 degrees Celsius are going to cancel, so that's just going to be joules is equal to negative 4.18, negative 418.4 joules per degree Celsius times TF minus 8,368 8, joules. That's 20 times 418, right? All right, so now what do we do? Combine like terms. Combine like terms. Good algebra yeah. terminology right there. Combine like terms. Sounds great. <laughs> so we're going to bring the 322, make it positive, bring it over here. Well, yeah, I guess this is going to be, no, let's do this. Let's bring the TF over here, so then we'd be, we're still going to be negative. 
and negative. Okay, we're just gonna deal with negative numbers. Oh, I see the problem. What's this, what's the problem here? It's gotta be a positive right there. I was gonna say, we're getting negative, negative. Somehow or other, the negatives all have to cancel out. Okay, so let's bring this one over here and add. Bring this one over here and add. So 3.225 plus 418. This plus this is going to be 421. Times TF is equal to 322 is 86. Okay, and just for unit's sake, this is joules per degree Celsius times TF. Now what do we do? Divide, Divide by 421.625. So the temperature only went up. 0.61 degrees because we have one fourth the mass way less smaller specific heat so just like it takes very little heat to, to heat it up it's going to it's going to have absorbed that so it's only got that much heat to be able to release back okay so the water has a much higher specific heat so it only went up just a little bit All right, so now I'm just gonna make up one for you to of those to forget to do. And then tomorrow in class, tomorrow in class, um, I'll probably we'll do some practice, I guess, some book problems or I'll find some problems like these. To just kind of practice will be your assignment at home um, just to do those. All right, so what would be the final temperature of 50 grams of water? Celsius when 50 grams of aluminum at 100 degrees Celsius is added to it. Specific heat of aluminum is go to a trusty periodic table specific heats on the bottom left corner 0 0.90 
professional at that time. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's wrong. Yeah. Okay. But compared to what we just had, go. No, no, I'm just not. Do we have more or less of the metal than we did on the original pump? More. And is the specific heat higher or lower? For aluminum and gold or less? No, no aluminum. No, higher. Higher, almost nine times higher. Yeah. And so, therefore, there's a lot more heat stored in that aluminum than there was in the gold. And you have more of it. So when you put it in the same amount of water, 100 grams, well, actually only 50 grams of water, half the amount of water, it's gonna cause a much bigger temperature change than the gold did. So that is a logical value. So it's not right in the middle between the two, but it's higher than the one you just did because of those two factors. y'all so far have gotten the same answer which I'm assuming is the right answer but for those of you at home for your viewing pleasure Q lost is always equal to negative Q gain we're going to be using this in other types of problems that we're going to do in this unit okay so just to kind of consolidate now we know that the, that's going to be the mass of the aluminum which is 50 grams aluminum times specific heat of aluminum of 0 0.90 joules per gram degrees Celsius times T final minus 100 degrees Celsius is equal to negative mass of the water 50 grams specific heat is 4.184 times T final minus 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so there's your setup. And then when you go through and do all the math, yeah. So it doesn't matter which one you use negative, right? It does not. It, 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 as long as these are right, no. it doesn't matter which side you make negative. I just always use Q loss equals the negative of the Q gain. The Q loss is going to be whatever was gained just on the negative. But again, it doesn't matter which one, which one you put. So if you do all the math, I don't need to go through the algebra. And you all all got 38.3 degrees, right? Now, I was asking Anna, said, is this a logical answer? We just did the one with the gold where it was 20.61. It only went up 0 0.61 degrees with gold. This one went up 13 degrees, okay? But let's look at the differences. First off, you have 50 grams of aluminum versus 25 grams of gold. So you got twice as much. Plus, the specific heat of the gold is 0.129. Specific heat of the aluminum is 0.9. That means aluminum at 100 degrees is going to have a lot more stored energy. It's going to take more energy to heat it up, which means it has more stored energy that's going to be released when it puts in the cold water. And we have 50 grams of water versus 100 grams of water. So we have half the amount of water, double the amount of metal, and the metal has a much higher specific heat. Therefore, the change in temperature is still significant. However, 50 grams of aluminum, 50 grams of water, equal amounts, it didn't come out to right in the middle. It didn't go from 100 to 25, which would halfway would be 60 something, okay? It didn't get to there because the specific heat of water it takes so much more energy to raise water than it does the aluminum. So because the specific heat of water is so high, the temperature is much closer to the starting temperature of the water than the aluminum. All right, welcome back. Getting back into the flow. I know you missed out on this exciting stuff, but thermo, thermo is fun, it's interesting very practical, but it's always uh, a challenging unit. Last year, it only took two retests. I mean, two tests, a test and a retest. The year before that took two retests. But <laughs> we're going to do better this year.
All right. I'm also probably going to share a um, survey with y'all tomorrow that they're making us do um, that you guys can kind of do online. I, don't, I haven't even looked at it yet to know how long, but it's probably not that long. So practice problems and survey. <laughs>